to say it. They will, you will not be an idle one, which is a lazy, or to Argos, a lazy, unprofitable, sluggish person. You will not be a lazy, unprofitable, sluggish person if you are swift to obey and orchestrate upon your life those things he mentioned earlier. It's impossible. Impossible. So if you are being lazy, which I have done at times, then it's a clear indication that you're not swiftly obeying and orchestrating upon your life those things. So you say, I'm having a lazy day today. Well, just know when you do that, then you're not swiftly obeying and orchestrating upon your life the things you just mentioned. I'm not saying that making fun of you or me, we've all been there, done that. I'm just saying to you and me to keep ourselves more in awareness that remember what we're, what we're trading off there. And you say, gosh, that's so, that sounds so intense. I, I need some time to take my armor off, man. I need to relax a little bit. I need to decomp just de-stress. I, I know. But you know, what, what God's reminding you of is when you do that, and then the enemy comes into the camp, and you're going, oh, get my armor on. Then he pierces you. You pull your armors on. Don't blame me. And don't get mad when I told you the attack had come at any moment. I told you, and I told you, and I told you. You have a right to go relax. That's your right. That's my right, too. But then know the risk you're taking. At any given moment, the enemy could attack. A situation, inwardly, outwardly, the enemy himself, you don't know that. And so when it does happen, you go, oh, crap. Well, <laughs> did you do what verse 5 said? Well, was this not fair? You weren't ready and overly flowingly prepared to overcome that situation. Look yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, I'm not going to beat myself up here, but I know the way out of the victory. The way out of victory is, I wasn't prepared then, but you're not going to catch me that same mistake twice. I'm not doing that twice. I'm going to prepare myself right now in the midst of it. I didn't do it before, but I'm certainly going to do it in the midst of it. I'm certainly not going to make that same mistake twice. So I'm going to double down, get more ready now, get more prepared already now in the midst of the circumstance, because I missed it before it happened. But I'm certainly not going to miss it again in the middle of it. So the danger is, before it happens, we don't get prepared, and it comes upon us, and we get discouraged. So we don't even try in the middle of it to, to do the things we're supposed to do. And I would tell you that you should still need to do that in the middle of it. There should be no quit in us. We're going to get caught sometimes with our you know, hand in the cookie jar, if you will, not doing the right thing. But you've got to make sure that you, you come back to every moment. Every moment matters and counts. So just don't, if you want to have that place where you can ever be found to be lazy or unprofitable or sluggish to God, then fine. Then you've got to do those things constantly. Always be prepared. But who can do that? My doctor, by the way, I went to a visit on Tuesday, and he said he had, he had a great line he told me. My cholesterol was a little high, and so was my thyroid. And so anyways, he said, well, you're the only person, one of the few people I have, I've been seeing him for, since 97, so that's 20 years. Is that right? Yeah, 20 years, 20 plus years. He said, you're one of the few patients I have that your, your outflow of your reading is directly related to your eating and exercise. You're like directly related to that. Like, you, like I've seen the, the chart change in 30 days. Like we can get retested 30 days later and as soon as he tells me, then I go back and I focus and I can get it right. He's one of the few people that makes that kind of a difference like that. So he goes, people can do it, but you're one of the few that actually does it. And I've seen it, so I'm not going to put you on meds because you keep on, keep on doing this. Bad than good, and bad than good. <laughs> so he goes, so he goes, no, I was, and I'm not. I got to lose focus. Yes? Because then, it's all that kale. <laughs> it's all that kale, right? Yeah, I told him, I said, I don't get the whole fact my cholesterol is high when I ate. I gave up steak and pork and chicken, and I don't understand. I'm eating fish and veggie. What's up, dude? And he goes, just, you're, just, you're just predispositioned to it. And I went, that sucks. He goes, I got triathlons in here, guys that run cyclists, the, the things, all kinds of competitions. And one to 500 people like that is have high cholesterol. Just is. I go, that sucks. <laughs> is that, yeah. Yeah. And Todd said the meds will make you sicker. Yeah, I know, right? That's why I'm not on them. So anyway, so the point, but the point B, he said this to me. He said, he goes, you can do this. If you live the straight and narrow of exercising the right way, eating the right way, you'll be fine. But here's the problem. Someone like you, because of your predisposition to this, this issue, has to live just that, the straight and narrow. But the problem is we can't do that. We'll fall off and come back and fall off and come back. And you're a perfect example of that. Look back four years and your records show just, ver just, show, just, they show just that. <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> he goes, and he goes, so, so the point is, I thought of that comment he made to me in a, in a real li medical factual conversation we had on Tuesday. And I thought, you know what, that's true in our spiritual life. That you can go back to front. So you can basically be ready and over prepared and you'll do well. 
but it doesn't mean you're always gonna do well. It doesn't mean that. But the question is, when you get the bad news, like I got on Tuesday, how do you respond to it? Do you, are you gonna just go, forget it, you know? I wasn't ready and prepared, so screw it. No, do the best you can in the situation to continue to get ready and prepared to do the best you can to win that fight when you're in it. Don't just give in to the fact I wasn't ready beforehand, therefore I'm gonna give in to the consequence. I deserve it. Stop, that's not good thinking. Don't do that. Fight, fight. So he says here, but if you continue to stay beforehand ready to prepare, then yes, you'll never be found lazy, unprofitable, or sluggish. He says, nor will you be found a carpos, which is unfruitful, or barren, a fruit. He says, because these things, they make you, or that is kathasimi, they will tasimi, to stand, kata, a permanent fixture. They will make you firmly planted and placed and appointed in the right order. <laughs> so you want to have the best shot possible. People always ask me, how do I get to the hundred fruit year? Well, be overly prepared, always ready with the things he mentioned in first Peter chapter one, excuse me, second Peter chapter one, verses five through seven. You do those things with readiness and overly preparedness, then he tells you for a fact you will not be found sluggish. You will not be found unprofitable. You will not be found idle. You will not be found without fruit. As a matter of fact, they will catastasimi. They will permanently put you in a set place in order that you'll be good to go. So you do that, you're good. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm sorry, I can't pull that off. If you can, let me know how you do it, because I can't do it all the time. I'm, I, but I know it's my goal, though. And he says, don't be un they will make you not unfruitful into the Lord of us, Jesus, anointed the knowledge. So unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, which is his epinosis. So it will never make you idle. In other words, people always say, I want to always learn and know about God's word. I want to know. Then you have to be in those situations. So you do what he says in verses five, six, and seven, then you'll never, ever, ever say to me, I can't read God's word and, and see anything. That's not true. If you want to read and see things in God's word all the time that are deeply understanding about who he is and what his word says about him, do the things he asks you to do in verses five, six, and seven. So people say, doesn't mean you always will. It just means that, that you put yourself in the best position to do that. And he'll, he'll, he'll give it to you, but how, how, to what magnitude's up to him. But he will give you insight into his word for a fact. He's guaranteeing you that as a promise. To what magnitude, that's on him. But he'll definitely reveal to you more about himself, more about his word, if you do verses five, six, and seven. It's that simple. So then he says in verse uh, nine, for he who is not possessed of these things is, is blind. That is blind as in a person who is uh, two flows, as in who is enveloped in smoke. Un un he, he can't see clearly. In other words, you are involved in questionable activities and questionable thought processes that blind you. You're not, you're not like doing adamantly wrong, for example, but you may be just kind of compromising maybe where you shouldn't be, justifying where you shouldn't be engaging in thoughts and actions you shouldn't be. And so you are not possessed. He was not possessed of these things as blind. That means you're not able to see clearly. You can see, but not as clearly, as detailed as you, your discernment's a little off. You don't kind of see things the way you should. He says, closing his eyes. Well, that means moral pausa, being short-sighted. That means you have to squint to see. So the idea is you don't have your eyes closed. It looks like your eyes are closed because you have to try even if you're not doing the things he tells you to do in verses five, six, and seven, it makes it so that your life can be kind of hazy. It makes it so that you have to try all the harder to see what God's doing. And you try all the harder to make it right. And you're trying all the harder to discern what is going on because you're, so, you're being short-sighted. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. And he says, he says, having become forgetful of the purification of the old sins. You're forgetful of the catharismos, of what made you clean of the old. In other words, you're forgetting the general, the knowledge, the, the gnosis, the general knowledge of who God is, his loving, kind, and compassion. You're getting so caught up into the, the, the pains and anguishes of life, the pains and corruptions of other humans upon you, the, the, all the other stuff. He's saying you, you're missing the point. Remember who you are, who God's bestowed upon you, a great and wonderful blessing beyond comprehension. Now, by the way, I'm just, I'm not saying, it's, it's just easy just to say, but it's not easy to, to do. It, it, but he's, <laughs> I can't put it into words, but he's trying, he continues to tell us that we are unique. We're so unique and so different and so <coughs> minority in view of all the people considered to be knowing who God is in Christ, of those who are in Christ, 
he's, he's telling us less than 10% have been given the blessing, God, godly love and compassion and insight he's given to you and me. There's so few of us out there from the history of the world, let alone in the present reality. There's less than 10% of us, dare I say even single digit percentages of us, that fit this mold. And he's saying with that comes this great responsibility of remembering through all these things that that's the real issue here, that you're not really you. Your life's not really what you think it is. It's nothing but a testing ground. It's a proving ground. It's nothing more than a passing through and seeing God's hand in your life and, and seeing how I can respond to it. Regardless of what it makes me feel and what it does unto me, how do I get through it? How do I get through it and see more of God and trust more in him? And so that's why he says in verse 10, therefore, therefore, or dia, through this, rather, brethren, do you earnestly strive. By the way, same word that he used earlier in verse 5 for diligent. Remember that word I told you before, that it means to swiftly obey, to spode. So, all the, therefore, brethren, swiftly obey. Be diligent. Be quick to do what God says to do. Don't waffle. Don't flip-flop. Don't meander. Don't justify delaying what you know is right. Just do it. He says, and make, but he says spe here specifically, to be quickly about what? About, about making your calling and your eklego. There's your chosen out from. So remember, called out is different than being chosen out. Chosen out, eklego, is different from ekkaleo. Ekkaleo is called out. Eklego means to be called, to be chosen out from. So ekleg with a G, eklego, or eklegi, is chosen out from those who are called. And then the called out are, are called from those who were chosen. They're called out to a higher level. That's the 30, 60, and 100. But here he says, earnest and never to make your calling, which is your kaleo, he says, make sure the calling of you, which in context isn't just the calling of those in Christ. Oh, no, no. This is the calling he's talking specifically to the same people he's been talking to, which is the called out ones. If you're wondering, how do I know he's talking to the same people? Chapter 3, verse 1. So get ahead a little bit, and he says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write to you, in both of which I stir up your sincere minds by remembering. So for those who may think, oh, he's making this up, they're both written to the same people. <coughs> Chapter 3, verse 1, and thank you very much. Okay? So therefore, the calling in verse 10, in context of what the first epistle already told you, they're the called out ones. He's speaking of the calling of the called out ones, which is their calling. Okay? So their calling, the calling of you, your calling, not the calling, your calling. Your, uh, the calling of you, it says on the left side of the margin, of you, the calling. That's why he says your calling, the calling specific to those people that are called out. So it's this firma truth. And the election, make it sure. What does that mean? The bios. That's an important word he uses again later on in the same chapter. It means to have a solid, unshakable foundation. <laughs> make your calling the knowledge of you being called out. And you're a clego, knowing, in other words, remember the few in number of privileged people that you represent. And make that a solid foundational truth in your, in your brain. Make that a solid foundational element of your spiritual remembrance that you never forget how blessed you are. Not in a way of being arrogant, not in a way of being weirdo about it, no, and a way of being grateful about it, of being humbled by it, of being just thankful for God that you are like one of the ten, you were the one leper out of the ten that just came back and said thanks. Not because you wanted to, because God made it so that you just were enlightened to understand that. How could other nine didn't say thanks? Why did God make it so that you and I have a gratefulness and thankfulness to him because he gave us something we don't deserve, we don't earn, because he just wanted to. Wow. Make that a solid, unshakable foundation of what your mind should always remind you of, what your spirit should remind you of, and your soul, and your very vibe of your being. Don't forget the uniqueness of who you are when you undergo trials and suffering, because it makes it more bearable when you remember what the goal is, when you remember who you're looking to please, when you remember where you will stand in front of one day. But you remember that the highest level of all creation, only a few will experience this close, tight-knit, warm embrace 
of double down, triple down, quadruple down love of God? Do you want that? Keep that in mind. That's what's at stake. That's what's in view. That's why you're in this proving round. That's why you undergo what you undergo. That's what's worth it all. Yes, it's worth it all. He says, since by doing these things, you will never fall. And that word is to stumble, pataio. You will never stumble if you do these things. By doing, that word is the ongoing doing. So if you're ongoingly doing those things he mentioned earlier, in verse 5, 6, and 7, then you'll never fall. Not only will you not be, right, not only will you not be unfruitful and sluggish and lazy and unprofitable, but you'll also never stumble. Well, he's telling you something that you'll, you can't pull off, obviously. He's just letting you know. When you're not stumbling, when you're not being lazy, and when you're not being unfruitful, that's because you are doing those things. So the opposite's true, too, right? So be, be positive about it. He's just giving you an idea of knowing what right looks like, knowing what the reference point that anchors us of what truth to come back to. It's not about, again, sustaining that level. It's about acknowledging it and desire, valuing that as, as being true and then working toward it. Okay, so knowing it, acknowledging it, and working toward it. And then he says in verse, <coughs> we're going to end with just the next two verses. We'll stop here. He says, for thus richly, well, verse 11, will be furnished to you the entrance. And by the way, the entrance is the means to enter, and then the furnished, I love it. It's the same word again, epikoriagio. Orchestrated upon you. In other words, it should say, for thus richly will be orchestrated upon you the means to enter. Do you see how it reads differently? <laughs> when you read it from the Greek language, what it means? Epikoriagio. So what's going to be orchestrated upon you, <coughs> suffering and pain and anguish, will be the means by which you enter into the, say, say something, say, say it again. I missed that. Yeah, verse 11 is telling you. You want to enter the kingdom? Well then, hello. He's epikoriagio and you're, he's orchestrating upon you the means of which you will enter. It's not easy. Nothing worth gaining in this life is, is, is that's worth it is, is easy. All the more so in the next life, all the things that are worth gaining take some sacrifice and anguish in this life. Come on. So, uh, that's what it is. Now, I say that like it's nothing, but believe me, in my own life, I think it sucks. But I'm just telling you, but I, but I, but I know this is still true. And I know I got to keep going through that mindset of telling myself, even though I think it sucks at the time, how I feel, I got to check that thought and say, stop it. Don't think that way. It, it's all for the betterment. Let's, let's, let's push through it. That's why I always say phrases like, it's not what's the right thing to do. It's, right in, it's not what's right in front of you that you, you can't do. It's the right thing to do that's more important, which usually means you get hurt by it, and in the long term, you're benefited by it. And that does suck, but it's, it actually, it's actually way beneficial. Then you can say things like, you know, that I say it's not how you, it's not what you do, it's how you do it that matters. Because you have the right to do something, it doesn't, doesn't mean you should do it. And it doesn't, so it, there's all these things I'll make phrases about which speak to this verse 11, which speak to the fact that he is epi orchestrating, epi choreagio, orchestrating upon your life the means from which you will enter. Yeah. So I said day seven, and this is said eight, July 7th, day seven. That's correct. Yep. Entrance is, the entrance is the real key phrase here. As you enter into day seven, you inherit day eight. Both of them are age lasting, but the difference is the entrance is day seven. That's what makes it day seven. So it says you will enter into the Aeonian kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Therefore, verse 12, another, another therefore. So in verse 10 is a therefore, and now in verse uh, uh, 12 there's a therefore. So here we go. <coughs> therefore, as he ends this, thought of this context. It's, this is just, his entrance is verses 1 to 12. It's like, his, it's like his body of his letter is from verse 13 on. His entrance, his introduction to the letter is verses 1 to 12. <laughs> just the introduction. See, we haven't gotten to the meat of the potatoes yet. This is the introduction of him building on the last letter he wrote. Verse, thir verse 12, the last verse we'll read for today. Therefore, I will not neglect always. I will not neglect always. I will not be careless, Emilio. I will not be careless. I will not be careless always to remind you, which is the hupa minisco, which is to remind you under, which is to hupo under, which is minisco to remind, 
to, in other words, to keep you in mind under what's at the, the context and what it's inferred is, to keep you under the mindset of what's at stake. You know, it's like the old, you ever seen the old movies that are based on documentaries of true stories of people that overcame such ridiculous odds? You ever seen stories like that where you have people that go, and they, and they had to keep the one guy who I heard about recently, who I, I think I mentioned to you before, I'm not sure if I mentioned, he, he, he was put in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, and he was separated from his wife that just got married, his wife that he loved from his youth, and they had, she was pregnant with child, and the Nazis took over and forced her to get an abortion. They lost their first child. Then her parents and his parents and her were brought in a different place. He was brought to a concentration camp. He didn't know that years later when he was freed that they were all murdered. But he said during the years that got him through, was he said to the love of his wife, the constant memory of love of his wife and what God had done in previous times, remembered that those days would maybe be better out ahead. And so all of us, I don't care if it's through regular hardship of life, whether it's in sports, whether it's in whatever, you have to keep in line, you have to remind yourself about what's out ahead. So if you have to tape a phrase to your, to your refrigerator of a verse, if you have to tape a picture of, of the beam of seat to, this, to your steering wheel, I don't care. But you've got to keep in mind what's at stake. You have to not get in that state of forgetting. That is what Peter is telling you. The first step of going down this path successfully is keeping it in front of your mind all the time. You cannot forget because there's too many things in this tentacles of this world that will pull you away from forgetting that. Some, there are, some are good things. The love for those around you, your loved ones, will pull you away from what's at stake, what's in view about your heavenly spiritual life and the next, next timeline, right? Sometimes it's the anguishes and troubles and, and pitfalls and challenges of life that pull you away. The responsibilities, the obligations pull you away. But the reality is, he says, never forget the hupo minisco. I'll never neglect, I won't be careless to remind you the hupo under minisco, to be reminded under the circumstance, what's at stake is really the context of what he's talking about. He doesn't want to ever forget to remind you what's at stake, to remain under, to remind yourself under the circumstances, what's at stake, what's the goal, remember, remember, remember. You of the, remind you of these things, although you know, and the word there is, you all, you are knowing, Aido, you are experiencing by seeing it firsthand. You see the struggle, you experience the struggle firsthand. And are established, stereo, sterizo, standing firm in the present truth. Although you know and are established in the present truth. The present truth is the pararimi, which is the right now, the right now and the truth, the reality that you're in. You already know. So in other words, he's, he's going to remind you, even though you have a present reality of suffering, even though you have a present reality of pain and anguish and sorrow, you may go, I got it in view. I know, man. I'm going through some stuff right now. I, I know. I know. But do you really know? You're going through the training, but do you, I think you forgot the goal, though, of the training. Well, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm sweating every day. I come home filthy, smelling like high on the hog. I got it. I know what's at stake. Do you, though? Because you're doing the activity doesn't mean that you're actually keeping in mind the end, the end in mind, the goal. And that's what Peter's saying. You know you're going through stuff in your life. We all know that. And we all know that suffering is being used by God. But do you really realize the end, the finality of it all, what it's being used for? Don't lose sight of that. That's what he's saying. Although you know the suffering, although you experience it, you see it in your life. I know, I know, I get it. But you're losing sight of the final goal. Can you see yourself one day? They always say that, that people who, do, who accomplish their, 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 their dreams and their visions and their goals is that they, they, they can see it. They can envision it already happening. So envision yourself being at the inspection and the father walks in with that shoveling process metaphor symbolic and he checks for the garment and he sees you and you get a big beaming smile across his face. Can you envision that being said of you? Can you envision that and then the door opens up and you see this, this undescribable scene of a, of, a, of a feast from which the bridegroom, Christ himself, your savior, your God, your Lord, your, your everything, and Shekinah glory, and you then are transformed into the like kind. 
and you embrace, what does that look like? <laughs> you know, what does that feel like? Do you want that feeling? Do you want that embrace? Do you want that moment? Well, then keep it in front of your mind when you're going through the pain and the anguish and the depression and the sadness and the anguish that all these people and things and situations are putting on you because that's all garbage. It's all distractions. When you look at it from the whole, it's just like anything else. You take a, a narrow scope, boy, it sucks. You start to take a broader scope and you realize it's really a blip on the radar when it comes to the full reality of what you are looking at what's out ahead. So it's just like anything else in life. So when you, when you start looking at, like for example, say, say it's our galaxy, say our galaxy, and we're a little tiny Earth, and what are you on that thing? I can't even see, you're like a speck on there. So what are your problems again? They're not much, are they? I just wiped it off with my finger. I'm just saying. I, and, and that's just a galaxy. And there's like millions of these. Uh -huh. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So God's just saying, and Peter's saying to you, keep in mind what's out ahead. Envision yourself. Don't, you know, big God, small problem. Small God, big problem. But we got a big God. We got small problems. So you, it's easy to say than do, but Peter's reminding us all the more of those of us who are in our situation, keep in mind what's at stake. Envision yourself and knowing where the real divine nature that he's given you to be a part of, that's what's at stake here. That's what's on the line. So you're gonna transcend, you're gonna transcend, you're gonna transcend the timeline where all those galaxies exist. He's gonna transcend the timeline and take you to a place where he's always existed. But somehow within time, but through the creator who's outside of time. I don't understand that. So you're gonna be in that realm. It's unbelievable. You'd be the closest to him as you anybody could ever possibly be. Ever. 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 So that's what he's saying. And, and so because of that, there's a lot of stake. There's a lot that you go through. So Peter's about to die, and to get ahead of you, two more verses later, he tells you about an eminent death that's coming upon him. So again, when you read this, don't read it from a guy, oh, he's just up there, you know, chewing on grapes and, and living the high on the hog like these pastors do today, and their nice fancy mansions and their nice jets and their nice comfy cottages and their parsonages, and they're living just fine. I'm not going to insult those pastors and stuff like that. There are some like that. We all know that. But Peter is coming, you, is coming to us, to you, and to them at an angle of perspective that says, I'm about to die. I've been in prison for a couple years, three years now. Well, two years since he wrote the letter. He's about to die one year later after his third year. And he knows it's eminent. And he's, and he's already recollecting in two verses he's going to tell you about. He's recollecting the words that Christ declared to him. You will die in the manner in which he died. He's recollecting that already. And he's writing this letter in lieu of not being different from, but same as. Not just an apostle, but a doulos, a servant, a slave to Christ. He's telling you that. So let us close in a word of prayer and remind ourselves of the goal out ahead. And do something this week that you'll always be able to look back to as something you can remind yourself to envision, whether it's a verse, whether it's a picture. But do something that's always in front of you that reminds you of what's at, what's at stake. And envision yourself in that final state, and that'll help you to overcome your current state. And then secondly, make sure you do those things in verses 5 to 6 and 7 that actually help us to be in the best position to win and to overcome. And if we don't have it the right way going into the battle, in the midst of the battle, then start putting on the armor. Don't stay unarmed. That's just not smart. <laughs> if you got caught unawares, okay, get your armor on <laughs> and start fighting. Don't give up. That's not a way to win. That's not a way to fight. If you're best always being prepared, absolutely. But if you get caught unawares, get prepared as soon as you can. Do the best you can to make the best of a bad situation. All right, so let's uh, close in prayer. So Father, we thank you for your time and your love that you show to us, that your loving Heavenly Father aspect of how you are such a, a teacher and lover of, of our, our lives to edify us, to encourage us, to show us the way from what is out ahead and to what is to be in, uh, in our lives to be imported, to be encouraging to us and to be anchored by your truth in our lives. Keep us steadfast and, and true to you. Establish in our hearts, Father, the sense of just knowing what we are to do and knowing that the preparation that you give us to be overly prepared and ready is, is paramount. That if, if and when we get caught in those situations unawares, to still fight through it all and to envision ourselves one day in your warm embrace, knowing that you've given us such a high, high calling of such a, a few and far between experience that you only offer to certain people in this 
this life. We thank you for offering that to us. We ask that we be just reminiscent of it all the time, cognizant of it all the time, to keep it in our forefront of our minds, to endure the trial, to be victorious in the suffering, and to walk to the other side and know that we can say it was worth it all. And so we thank you for being, our again, our faithful Father, our loving, forgiving, and sustaining, and restoring Father. We ask you to have your rod of correction be by our side. May it comfort us, and may it correct us. And may we fear no evil. For you did not give us the spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and of love. And we thank you for that. So we thank you, Father, for all you have done, are, are doing, are yet to do in our lives. On this Father's Day, we thank you, the greatest Father of all. And may each and every father have a wonderful day with your spirit and them and in their children to show them your love and your truth that evidence in their lives. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry, I was preaching today a little bit there.